Welcome everyone. We'll just give it a few minutes for others to join. Thank you for coming. We were gonna have music guys, but there's a tech fail. So we're sorry for the awkward silence. <laughs> if only I was good at singing, I would sing to you all, but I'm not gonna put you through that on a Friday at lunchtime. Well, depending on your coast. All right, we'll just give it a little bit more time. I see our attendance counting increasing. Welcome everyone. We'll just give it a few more minutes before we begin today. Now everybody's running from meeting to meeting. All right, we have a lot of content today. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. Um, and we are recording this. Um, so hopefully we'll share out for anyone who joins later. Thank you for joining. Welcome to our CRM and Loyalty Trends webinar. I am Melissa Berger and I am the head of CRM and Loyalty for Digitas. We're excited to bring you some incredible trends today in the space and look forward to getting any questions or feedback at the end. We are hoping to leave a little bit of time, but you are welcome to reach out to us as we go. So let's go ahead and get started, Steph. I wanted to introduce some of the key team members that are going to be joining me today. So again, heading up um, CRM and Loyalty, we also have Megan Ann Gruber, who is on the team, Darian Smith. Aaron Blake. And unfortunately, Sachin Panjwani is out sick today. We know that all those uh, late summer flus and colds are going around. So he will not be joining us, but wanted to make sure we um, showcased he's another key member of our CRM and loyalty team. So today, here are our key areas of focus. So first, we're actually going to define CRM and loyalty. Um, we have the big L and the little L of brand loyalty and what that really means. It's important for us to set the stage before we go into these trends, because you might say, are these really CRM and loyalty trends? In fact, they are for the way that we are defining this. We also are going to talk a little bit about what's an inspirational brand. This is really important. Darian's going to talk about some really key important notes and data points to support inspirational brands and why that drives loyalty. We're going to give you an overview of the trend and then go into each at a somewhat deep level as much as we can get into today. But again, we will be following up with the full deck so you can see all of the amazing examples that we have pulled forward. So thank you again for joining us um, and let's dive right in. All right, so before we dive fully into the trends, let's level set for a second about what we mean when we talk about CRM. CRM isn't a single channel like email and it's not a piece of software or MarTech. It's definitely not a one size fits all solution or a silver bullet to all of your sales problems either. What CRM is, is your customer strategy. It's how you can build relationships between your brand and your customers to build loyalty and ad advocacy. It's the connective tissue that ties together your customer data, tech, and experience strategies. And so that's why, as Melissa mentioned earlier, we think of CRM really broadly. So some of the examples we're going to take you through today might be a bit beyond how you've traditionally thought of CRM in the past. So with CRM being how you show your customers that you know them and building those reciprocal relationships with them, it really is the connective tissue between your creative executions and the data and technology that underpins them. And it's crucial that CRM strategists are fluent in all things media, tech, and data if we want to build those types of deep, meaningful connections that are going to drive lasting loyalty. So at Digitas, we think about loyalty two ways. You have your big L loyalty and then your little L loyalty. 
the big L loyalty is what everyone strives for. People love your brand and they tell everyone about it. They choose that brand over any other option on the market. Whereas little L loyalty is your actual program. It can't build brand love on its own, but it can certainly enable it by recognizing customers and providing that true value exchange. And so when we think about inspiring brands, you're most likely thinking of brands that have figured out how to really crack both big and little L loyalty. So the big L loyalty is really driven by inspiration. And so people desire to be inspired and brands can be a really big spark to that. You can see that 72% of customers want inspiration, but only half. And so while inspiration may have not have been a focus in the past, it will drive brand affinity um, in our ever-changing dynamic world. And so leaders um, in inspiration really do a good job of elevating the brand by helping people realize their aspirations. They make the brand magnetic by pulling people in and expanding their way of thinking. And they turn brands into a motivational force through meaningful and clear reasons to act. So now let's dive into our overview of our overview of trends and where we're going to be covering. Relationships between brands and consumers will be defined by that first party data and personalization relationship. Standout loyalty programs are well crafted because they are customer centric. Building up a brand's ecosystem presents new opportunities to add unexpected value to consumers' um, world. And at home delivery is experience and an important frontier to building a lifelong relationship with the brand. And building up a brand ecosystem presents new opportunities to add unexpected uh, value to everyone around them in their world. And marketing a brand's values, not only politics, is a direct way to inspire um, and build inspiration amongst consumers. So personalization and first party data, the future that we're striving to build towards. So first party data is essential for marketers as it will help build the relationship between both consumers and their brand. And so as we move away from third party cookies, um, we need to think about how we can build strong first party data strategies to establish new uh, relationships between uh, customers and uh, brands. So, however, only 46% of marketers feel like they're prepared for this change, but um, this change is coming. It's important to start building that relationship now to get that first party data that's so essential. So to prepare for that cookie future, uh, Unilever needed a way to increase their rate of gaining first party data. And so the pandemic forced changing behaviors to change, uh, by behaviors to change. And so the company aimed to tap into the our audience's interest in getting those promotions and coupons that could really help meet that time and moment um, under the pandemic. And so they used that mobile first in app uh, programmatic ads to really get customers uh, to take a Unilever survey. And so those who engage in the survey and input their data and information um, were instantly able to claim a reward for Unilever. And so what this showed was that this was a massive uh, data collection for this future that led them to have great insights around the consumers to target them more effectively and efficiently. And so this gave them a great view and across most worries within their enterprise. And so it really is a great example of how a large company like Unilever can lean in and collect first party data in really interesting ways that feel so seamless to their customers. Next, McDonald's did a really fun way of gamifying their app um, by using a, a dating app mechanic to help build in, uh, targeted ads for offers that uh, really drove for their consumers and products that they loved and that brought them back to McDonald's time and time again. And so this led to McDonald's being able to pull insights from their market research and it's um, helped them show why consumers would choose their brand because they had opportunities to claim offers and rewards that made just for them. Um, and consumers were able to input through swiping um, what products they liked and what made them uh, love McDonald's so much. And so it was really the foundation of a dating app game that enabled the cap them to capture that first party data through that swiping tender functionality. And so the campaign helped grow um, downloads and usage um, for McDonald's. Um, even though it was a market leader, it still found a way to increase its share um, through this fun way of gamifying a way to collect first party data. And so what this means for brands is that you need to define how first party data really empowers audiences. Think about those personal benefits from what your brands provide for consumers and how it will also help to grow the enterprise that therefore 
help them in their uh, life. We need to think about how we can inspire people along their customer journey. First party data should motivate and support buyers. And when it's done right, it can really help predict future needs for consumers. And you'll always be their go-to because of it. And we need to lean into that omni-channel uh, way of collecting first party data. We need to have fun with it. There are so many interesting creative applications and there are limitless opportunities to gather first party data. And remember, this is gonna be something that's gonna be ever more important as we get to that cohesive future. So what goes hand in hand with uh, first party data is personalization. And so as more data is collected, we will one day be in a world without ads due to that hyper-personalization. And so this really does show a unique lifelong direct to brand experience and personal relationship with consumers. You can see that 92% of marketers want their uh, expected prospects and customers to have that level of personalized experience. And it's gonna be an increasing demand and need. Thinking about this new startup, Puffo, they had to introduce some breakthrough um, to New Yorkers. And so they did a really good job of creating really tailored individual dog ads that demonstrated that their dogs need unique dietary plans depending on their dog. And so they lean into existing data to create a unique data that, uh, app for every dog that exists in New York City through an interesting and unique and innovative personalized um, algorithm. And so what this did was that it used AI technology to encourage trial through uh, potential buyers to see themselves and their pets in the brand. And so this really did a good job of inspiring people to engage with Puffo and to generate a uh, spike in their traffic and also increase organic web searches. So using existing data to help create personalization to help a startup brand breakthrough. Next, Supergroup did a really good job of leaning into what is assumed as a very personal and intimate space to connect with their audience. And so they found a really meaningful way to connect and present their brand purpose, but without using it and treating it as a dumping ground for spam. And so subscribers can easily join into their um, system and then are greeted with welcome messages and offers for exclusive new products and seasonal messages, but it isn't in a way that feels forced, it feels natural and personalized and tailored to where they are in their customer journey. So it can really build the relationship where Supergroup is viewed as their go-to ally for helping them protect their skin. And so what this did was that it allowed them to continue to grow its text messaging subscriber base year over year, and the brand's text messaging program delivered a high ROI and drove um, conversion because it didn't feel like it was a forced sales gimmick. It felt like they were really cared about their customer's skin. And so what personalization means for brands is that it's going to be expected more and more. And so people want personalization to feel human. They don't want it to feel intrusive. It shouldn't feel like a chatbot is talking to them. It should feel like their friend is talking to them and they're really looking out for them. And so we also need to reconsider our approaches to personalization and capabilities. Content isn't the end product, but think about how we can use first party data to optimize ads and content that's out there to continue to uh, present new and ongoing um, opportunities for customers to connect with the brand. And personalization and first party data are interconnected. So use those powerful tools to be provocative and innovative creatively to establish your brand in consumer's life. All right, so our next trend is all about loyalty. And we know that when done right, loyalty programs can be key drivers of both customer retention and sales, with in fact, almost 70% of consumers saying that their choice in where they shop is directly influenced by their ability to participate in a loyalty program. But it's not as simple as that. You can't just stand up a basic earn and burn program and watch the sales roll in. To be truly successful, you need to understand your customers innately and design a program that delivers value at every touch point. Because it's these relationships, not just the rewards, that are going to be the key to unlocking long-term loyalty. So it's important for us to marry those rational benefits that everyone expects with their program with the emotional needs of our customers. And so that loyalty really comes down to what needs are being met and what is that value exchange between the consumer and the brand. So how are some brands really excelling at this? Um, first example that we love, uh, Duncan's DD Perks program. It is a massive email operations initiative. They're sending you know, hundreds of millions of emails a year to uh, over 8 million customers in their database. And they're delivering loyalty through highly personalized communications at scale. 
by leveraging the wealth of data they have on their customer preferences, behaviors, and need states, Duncan's has really managed to activate insights by a creation of all of these fantastic dynamic journeys and offers in Salesforce that are designed to drive incrementality and deeper engagement with their program from the moment a customer joins DD Perks. And the result is really extremely highly personalized offers designed to intend these high value behaviors that are fueled from insights gleaned from purchase history, visitation patterns, customer preferences, and even down to things like the current weather and traffic in their area. So these feel very timely, relevant, and designed just for them. Another example of a brand we all know and love is Nike, the most valuable sports brand in the world. And they also have a leading loyalty platform that is bringing the extensive sports universe into the hands of their customers. And we, we all know this. I'm not telling you something you don't know right now. Nike is a powerhouse. They're a super inspirational brand. And their membership program really excels at providing members with exclusive offers, personalization, and an omni-channel experience that really drive community and reinforce the brand's purpose in the customer's lives. And it's certainly one of the more meaningful brands in a lot of people's lives, and certainly more than almost any other activewear brand. And for Nike, membership unlocks a wealth of data for them that they can use to fuel insights that drive everything from membership enhancements to product innovation, innovation to even inventory management. And so it's just, it's a really great, beneficial relationship for both their members and for Nike themselves. So what does this mean for the rest of us? First, loyalty programs can and should evolve to do more than track transactions and dole out rewards. It needs to be woven through every touch point and allow our customers to have a consistent experience everywhere they interact with us in any channel, wherever they choose to interact with our brands. We can't have them running into dead ends or force them to repeat themselves because we aren't connecting the data on the back end and have gaps in our customer understanding. Second, if we want our loyalty strategy to be truly impactful, we need to focus on the experience we're providing. Providing exceptional experiences can be a real key differentiator for your brand and help drive that big L loyalty we're all striving for. And finally, we should all be open to new technology because it can open up a whole new world of ways to personalize the experience. With the cookie-less future fast approaching, finding new ways to connect with your customers and, con and collect explicitly given zero-party data to enrich your first-party data will give you an opportunity to gain insights into a particular problem or blind spot that can really just help make your brand easier to do business with. Awesome. Let's dive into brand ecosystems. So what do brand ecosystems do, right? Um, essentially, they put the customer at the core. Um, you can see here that 2% of the top 100 brands focus their program on a complete ecosystem offering. That means there is a huge area of opportunity for brands in this space. Um, brands that root themselves in ecosystems provide a one-stop shop for all of their customers. And as Aaron just talked about, it also opens up this two-way dialogue that gives the option for these brands to grow, meet their customers where they are in the channels that they like to engage in, and then have a two-way dynamic relationship, offering them um, products, services of value, right? So there's a wide, um, wide array of ways that brands can explore this. Um, but the breath, the brands that do this best, they take it to the next level. And what I mean by that is they offer services and products that address the needs of their audience in the channels that they show up. So let's take a look at some brands that do this pretty well. So Equinox, um, this is one that is uh, actually a favorite because they are a renowned luxury brand, but they started out as a gym experience, right? And so how have they tailored that and, and changed the mindset of their customers? Well, to evolve from a brick and mortar, what they really initially were focusing on was fitness, but to switch that mindset, they had to deliver that promise and that experience to their consumers in all the ways that they showed up. So they developed a universe of signature experiences for customers to return to for inspiration. And then that was their first step in becoming this lifestyle brand. 
but they continued. They didn't stop there. The, they continued to work both online and offline. So they took their spas, their fitness facilities. They created an online magazine. They um, have dipped their toes into performance wear. They have a mobile app. So they have really come full circle in their suite of offerings and to create a really interconnected set of services and a wide range uh, that addresses the wide range of needs for their customers. And again, this is a two-way dialogue. Customers are coming in, they're experiencing the brand and they're giving feedback. And thus Equinox is able to create this ecosystem that works around the consumer with the consumer at the core. Another great example that I love is um, KitchenAid. So this one specifically is the Made for Makers campaign, but what KitchenAid did, they're, uh, we all know them, uh, most of us probably have uh, their mixer in our kitchens, right? But um, they launched a campaign centered around personalization. And with personalization being at the center of the brand's ecosystem, it made it feel like home for the consumers. So what the brand did is they dove into research, as many brands do when they start. When they're really trying to get customer insights, it's a great place to start. Um, and this illuminated one singular human truth that those folks that like to cook, I'm sure there are a lot of hand raisers in our group here today, people that like to cook when when making food, it's an effort that comes from the soul and it feeds the soul. So they paired the research with what they knew about their customers, what the brand's promise is, and they married that with personalized content. And they aligned on both goals and attitudes of their audiences and were able to think of human interactions as agents of transformation that shaped their entire approach. They also um, created a documentary with Hulu and it's called A Woman's Place. And it was both a documentary and a mentorship program. And it served as a way for KitchenAid to establish that big L of loyalty, a brand that we all look up to, we love, we infiltrate it into our lives. It becomes a staple, as I said, you know, it's beyond just the KitchenAid mixer in my, in my kitchen. It, I feel connected to the brand because of this, because of their suite of offerings and how they've taken the customer and put them at the core and made offerings that, that really resonate with wants and needs, the head and the heart, if you will. So what, what does this mean, right, for brands that aren't KitchenAid and Equinox? Um, they really, to, to excel in a brand ecosystem, you have to win at both first party data and personalization. Um, when you are addressing the real wants and needs of your customers, you're able to bang home long-term loyalty. And Aaron touched on a lot about what long-term loyalty means. It's not just addressing those quick responses, those rewards, but it's also the getting at the heart of the consumer, solving a problem for them, um, being empathetic, right? So <clears throat> fostering that long-term loyalty is very important. And then lastly, um, one big benefit is uh, one product promotion indirectly benefits all of the products in that suite. So if you think of cross-promoting um, cross products, such as like Apple does this really well with a Mac and then the iPhone and the Apple Watch and this, um, and Microsoft has their suite of products as well, that this is, it's almost like pollinating. So it's, it's a win-win. And we can go to the next slide. Um, let's talk a little bit about direct to consumer, our fourth trend. So what, what really, what does that mean? Um, this became a big uh, initiative that a lot of brands in and, and post COVID have said, oh, I wanna get into this space, right? This is what I should be doing. Um, but really it, DTC brands are unique because they, are uniquely positioned to offer that first impression and moment of truth. Not all brands can go and have a D2C offering, but when you are able to marry the insights from your customer and potentially bring that to their doorstep, it's transformative. So the receipt of a product um, is a way to engage with your consumer. And many of these um, that used to be socially native brands have taken that extra step and gone and opened a storefront, for example, a Glossier and Everlane and Allbirds. These, these brands that have gone from D to C to having a physical presence are the ones that are able to take the, um, the post-delivery elements and 
reinforce that brand story in a live physical location. So let's talk a little bit more a little bit more about what this is, what they're doing well, and talk about, about some of those examples. Birchbox. So this is a really interesting example because um, Birchbox historically make up subscription box that would arrive at your doorstep. Um, they have partnered with an organization called Femtech Health. And what they've done is they've enriched their first party data um, store, right? So they've identified um, with using that data, that first party data, they have identified additional opportunities to present relevant skincare products, supplements, birth control, pregnancy tests to, to subscribers when and where it makes sense. So this is an excellent example about how um, first party data and personalization can enrich a different element of CRM and loyalty. So your DTC brands. Um, <clears throat> separately, the new category of products, uh, it served to kind of re-enliven the brand. It differentiated Birch, Birchbox in this crowded D2C space. We've seen a lot of D2C brands struggling um, post-pandemic and even a little bit in the middle of the pandemic by just kind of trying over oversaturated space. Um, but they've really thought about what does my consumer need and how can I meet them and continue to have this dialogue, hear what they're saying and evaluate their wants and needs and incorporate that into what we need to create and how we need to service them. Um, so really they have an opportunity to expand their brand experience and make it relevant for their buyers and their customers throughout different stages of their journey and different stages of their lives, right? So that's a pretty cool concept and a pretty cool partnership that they were able to um, create. So let's talk about the takeaways. Oh, excuse me, actually third love. So forgot about this example. This is um, actually one of my favorites as well. So it's a fan favorite. And what I love about it most is in this um, very intimate space, Third Love was able to take that moment of truth and become a critical, critical, almost ally for women across the board. They place inclusivity at the center of everything they do. It's at the core of everything they do. And they've created a hook towards program that offers things that are beyond your um, just simple 10% off discounted awards. They offer things that are unheard of in this space, like things like first, first free trial underwear use, which in an intimate setting, things of this nature, you just haven't heard of in the past with lingerie brands. Um, and separately, they've done something really innovative in this digital space and created something called a Fit Finder. And they've used over 75 million data points to capture and influence every aspect of their business. They've used it to differentiate themselves in the space, but they've also used it to understand that their audience is craving more than just intimacy and, or excuse me, intimate wear and lingerie. They are looking for loungewear. They're looking for sleepwear and they're looking for active wear by a brand that understands them. So while those spaces may be crowded, they are trusting Third Love with their data and with their personal information. So it's a win-win. So let's talk about the takeaways here and what that means. <clears throat> so really it means physical packaging is beyond, it's, it's the first part of engaging with the brand. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that you just ship at home and your package arrives, you know, shift it around in your box or potentially broken. It's, it's their first engagement with a customer. Brands are able to reflect their identity through the home delivery experience, which is huge. Packaging captures the nature, the values, and often helps to define the brand with the customers. Secondly, first party data and personalization, again, are the bread and butter to these DTC brands. I talked a little bit about at the beginning about the brands that have gone from being socially native to really offering um, that whole in-store experience, putting their toes in what that looks like. And that's all because they have a differentiated and better degree of personalization because they really know their customer. They have robust databases and they are thoughtful in the way that they show up and how they engage with their customer. 
And lastly, they prioritize e-commerce and subscription models. So this is a big area of opportunity for these brands and what they do really well. Traditional brands consider this and how they can develop robust programs, but DTC brands really excel here because they're able to marry the model with the convenience that consumers expect. Um, so they're really taking those key principles of CRM and nailing like the moments of truth and they think through the value exchange from the jump and instill this from the get-go. So they're really um, ones to look at. So marketing our brand values means that brands need to not necessarily lean into the political divide, but instead lean into their purpose and what inspires them as a brand. So when we think about how they can do that and what inspires them to do that, um, brands have an opportunity to um, show how they've been champions within the space for a, an extended amount of time and not new to it. And so they have the right to identify with that social cause, not because of its years, but because they hold those values so dear and they champion them so much. Um, a great example that was touched on with KitchenAid, a woman's place, was something that they tapped into uh, the woman power history of the brand. And so um, that was an initiative brought to life by Digitas. And so we had a great chance to really show how KitchenAid has always been fighting for women's rights, and uh, especially in the kitchen and chef space. And so you see that 13% um, of consumers will pay up to 50% more for our products or services if they believe that it's making a positive impact for the world. So this is a really great way to help drive inspiration, thereby a lifelong loyalty relationship with a customer and their customer base because they believe them as such an innovator and someone who speaks out um, against a political climate. And what I think is really exciting and interesting is that brands that do it right and have that level of creative bravery, they don't just have and reflect the times that we're in, but they are drivers of it. And so this is just an increasing demand that's going to be expected with um, younger generations, generations like myself, Gen Z, um, who really are looking for brands to be leaders in uh, marketing their brand values and speaking for the little man. And so IKEA saw this and it's always been a leader in speaking for sustainability. And so they realized that all businesses need to fundamentally change the way that they operate to ensure that the plan is gonna be here for generations. And so despite um, its efforts in this regard um, for many years, there was a lack of awareness around IKEA sustainability efforts. And so um, it sought out to enable 1 billion people globally to live an everyday life in keeping with the planet's limitations by 2030 through this really exciting and interesting activation around a tiny house that was completely built in a sustainable way while showing off all products from IKEA's portfolio. And so it was really exciting that IKEA got a lot of reach with this campaign, but it also helped to cement that IKEA has always been a leader um, in championing for sustainability, leaning into its values and not shying away from it because there's an emerging class and generation of people who are really concerned about the planet around us. And so this was a full 360 campaign that, that leaned into different partnerships with media and had a 360 virtual tour and had full influencer content and an explainer video, all focused around sustainability and how IKEA is really a driver in the space for it. Next, um, Gillette did a phenomenal job of flipping its long, uh, long-standing tagline of the best thing that a man can get by questioning modern um, takes on masculinity saying, is this the best a man can get? There's been a lot of conversation around masculinity over the last uh, 10 years around how men need to tap in more to their emotions. And so Gillette wanted to connect um, with the younger generation and show that they have relevancy in this space um, by showing that uh, customers can look to Gillette to be a leader in um, building and believing in and supporting um, men and a new evolution of masculinity. And so it saw an opportunity to start the conversation of what best means and the next generation of men by turning its iconic tagline, the best a man could get into a question. And so it dared to push that conversation, to push the envelope, and it didn't shy away from it whatsoever. And it was able to connect to that new generation. And there was a lot of buzz around this piece. Um, it really got a lot of people talking about how Gillette is a leader in these new um, ways of thinking about masculinity. So again, leaning into its marketing values as a brand and how they could be a leader of change instead of, a, a, instead of being a bystander. 
So I think this is a great example to show how brands, when they play in their space and it feels authentic, it can really break through in a meaningful way. And um, and honestly, this is something that people are just expecting more and more as we are watching this dynamic world change around us and people are asking questions around um, how big companies can lean in and help um, support smaller individuals. And so what this means for a brand is that with everything that's happened, even before 2020, but even post-2020, brands need to build their reputation through action, not images, not lip service, but instead really leaning into commitments that really tie into their marketing values to help show that they can have an important relationship with customers who are affected by the causes of the social issues that are happening around them. Um, you can easily see an example of Nike and Colin Kaepernick around the Black Lives Matter movement and how that was a really bold take on creative bravery, but it felt so right by using an athlete who's always been around and as social activists and using that as a way to show how Nike believes in this cause and issue. Next, we need to think about how senior leadership can really walk the walk um, when it comes to showing its values instead of articulating them. Um, we need to think about how leaders can really lean into their purpose-driven efforts and really speak on the company's philosophy and take it into account when customers, when they're talking to customers and reaching out to them. This will build uh, an authentic relationship with customers because they will believe that the company stands for what they're talking about. I think a clear example of this has been in Jerry. Their ice cream is phenomenal and they've been a long time um, activists on social activists. And so people are believing their brand and the return to their brand, no matter how much it costs, because they really do believe that the product that they put out and the social activism that they rally behind is authentic to them and means a lot to them. Next, um, brand purpose campaign should be authentic and geared for the long term and really lean into people power. And so you can't be, uh, can be modest about it, but you need to be authentic and raw about it. They should really use this campaign that's rooted in that brand's history and equity and keeping with an overall uh, marketing approach. So it's still concise and um, reaches the audiences that we're talking to, but still feels like you are breaking through and speaking to social issues that are affecting them in a really interesting and provocative way. So the campaign should be about people, not the brand, and create a really big cultural movement. And so I think this is just a great way to show how brands um, are um, at their best and they are trying to achieve that inspirational level of building a relationship and inspiring um, consumers and customers, uh, they have an ample runway to lean into their values and market it clearly and concisely. Thank you, Darian, um, Megan, Ann, and Aaron. So lots to unpack. Uh, hopefully the examples helped everyone understand kind of how we ladder this back to building relationships and, and driving loyalty, whether that's Big L or a program. Um, one clarification, apologies. Um, Epsilon now runs the Duncan program. Want to just clear that up for everyone. Um, we did kind of start building and, and digging in with Salesforce in the beginning, but now uh, our Epsilon family friends run and operate that program from a loyalty perspective. So clarification there. Uh, so let's talk through some key takeaways. And I, I think there's some powerful examples here around what this looks like more broadly. So first, unlocking value for customers with first party data. We know, again, we've mentioned the cookie list future multiple times. We know it's been pushed back. I'm sure you're actually sick of hearing about this. However, brands are not 100% ready yet. So if you don't have plans, please, please, please talk to us, your other partners, whoever it is to make sure you are ready for this. Um, brands really need to work harder to add value to their customers' lives and think about that journey. And why would we give you that data? So it's really important to think about the value you're bringing, the exchange you're providing, and making sure that you're using that data properly. I think I heard a quote um, at a recent conference around, if you collect data, it is literally criminal not to use it. So make sure your strategy is set, make sure you're leveraging it appropriately. Um, second, focusing on relationships, not rewards. We have seen a continued evolution in loyalty programs, um, especially recently. There's so many more elements than just earn and burn. It's not just about a, a tangible reward. It's about an experience. And we know that experience drives so much of loyalty, that big L to a brand. So functional benefits still matter. There is still a role for that. You still need to provide that value, but it's more about that delivering the overall customer experience and having that emotional connection. That doesn't mean I cry every time or I jump for joy every time I see you in my inbox. It means that I have a connection with you and I value what you're bringing to me. 
co-creating that ecosystem strategy. True leaders in this space are really allowing participants, including those customers, to actually cooperate in the evolution, making sure that we're providing user value, we're evolving brand, um, the brand strategy overarchingly, and it's really beyond products and platforms. I think you've heard enough of that today that product first cannot be a long-term strategy. We know that's what you're selling, uh, but it's very important to think about um, how your brand comes across, the importance of, of how you're bringing your customers through and being customer-centric overarchingly. So D2C is something that we've seen a big shift in over the last couple of years. So many brands who did not have any sort of direct to consumer experience have really come online and realized, uh-oh, I, I really need to build this. Some had to do it in weeks. Others have seen the evolution over years. We've also seen some brands who have said, I don't know that this is actually working. Um, and actually, we we agree. If it's, if it's not doing well, cut ties and move on. Um, you need to make sure that you're actually driving that engagement that's appropriate. So as we think about the key principles of CRM, this will help you actually excel at D2C. Um, you need to think about those moments of truth, like we mentioned, think about the value exchange and, and making sure that we're actually instilling trust from the get-go. You can have CRM without D2C. You cannot have D2C without CRM, right? You need to have comms that actually engage um, throughout people purchasing, um, coming to your site, coming to your, your experience. And then I love this kind of takeaway for the last one, Darian, of stop the uh, performative of allyship. Um, you know, we expect brands to not only have a voice, but take that action. It is not enough to post on Instagram, y'all. It's just not. Um, it's great to have a point of view, but it cannot be done um, when it's feeling just kind of forced and half-assed. So um, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, make sure that you're actually driving the change behind what you're saying. And I love, Darian, the, the conversation around has to come from the top. Um, that's across every single organization. Um, so make sure that you align with your brand values. Um, and it's really important to think about what that means for the rest of the experience. So we will open up to questions. Um, we have a little bit of extra time. We also um, go, but if you don't mind, Steph, go back. This slide has our email addresses. We would love to hear from you directly. Um, all of us are first name, last name at digitas.com. So that's very easy to remember. You can also find us on LinkedIn. So if you want to have a separate one-on-one -on -one conversation or um, whether you have questions or a philosophical point, we would love to hear from you. But if anyone has questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we can answer them as they come in. So we'll just give everyone a few minutes if they want to add. Um, and I got another question around um, getting into loyalty and CRM within Digitas without previous experience. I think if this is related to a future job opportunity, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, obviously we have roles open, we, we post them and that's something we can definitely chat through. Um, so I'm guessing that's the angle that that question kind of came in on as well. Well, if no one has questions, um, we can absolutely give everyone a little bit of time back. Um, thank you for the anonymous. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, any other questions? We can give it a couple minutes if you're typing. I don't wanna end too soon. Hopefully we just gave you so, so much information that you don't even know what to do with it and you wanna digest and come back to us. One other thing to consider is we will be sending this out after. Um, there's probably some people watching this who didn't attend. Please, again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any comments or questions. Um, but, you know, again, we're happy to answer anything as a follow-up as well. All right. Well, I think we will give you all 15 minutes back on a Friday then. Thank you so much for joining. We appreciate your time.